Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and it's always an honor to have you back with us here on EWTN's Living Divine Mercy. Coming up this Monday, January the 8th, we celebrate an incredibly important feast, the baptism of Jesus, as described in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Along with the crucifixion, the baptism is the event most accepted by scholars as indisputable historical fact. But what does it all mean for us today? We are This year, the day before the baptism of Jesus, is the Epiphany on Sunday, January the 7th, which this year was transferred from its normal date of January the 6th. The solemnity of the Epiphany of our Lord is one of the oldest Christian feasts we have. The word Epiphany comes from a Greek verb meaning to reveal. So, it is when Christ is revealed to man. So, the feast is known as a theophany, the revelation of God to man. The epiphany was originally celebrated in four different events. The baptism of Jesus, the wedding at Cana, the birth of our Lord, or the nativity, and the coming of the Magi, or the visit of the three kings. But today, we only celebrate the Epiphany as the visit of the Magi or Three Kings Day. And then the next day, the baptism of Jesus is celebrated, which this year, as we said, is the very next day, Monday, January the 8th. So did you get all that? At Christ's baptism, the Holy Spirit descended and the voice of the Father revealed that Jesus is his Son. Another reason the baptism used to be included in the Epiphany was because, as we said, it is a theophany, a revelation of God to man. In this case, God the Father directly revealed who Jesus is. He is his son. Jesus was baptized and began his public ministry at age 30, which was the age of full maturity to the Jews. So again, this all makes sense. So why is all of this important? Because I personally believe that the main reason that the world is in the mess that it is in is because we are not baptizing our children. At baptism, we are given the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. This is love not on a natural level, but on a supernatural level. If we don't have this, we cannot love anyone in the way Christ loved them. Without this, our love remains only on the natural level. Also, it is at baptism that we are given the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which then manifest the fruits of the Holy Spirit after our confirmation. That was on our Christmas episode. So, you can see, without baptism, the Holy Spirit cannot fully work in us. And that is what is lacking in the world today. The Father created us. The Son redeemed us. But the role of the Holy Spirit is to sanctify us. And this is the only work of God not done yet. To be sanctified means we are made holy, and that is the biggest job yet to be done by God. So, in a way, the Holy Spirit is the most active in the world today if we let him. And this makes sense because after Christ ascended to the Father, it was the Holy Spirit who was sent back down to earth, which was Pentecost. And like us, At our confirmation, the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit to go out and love in a way they had never done before. Even before Christ ascended to the Father, he said that the apostles will not know him until he sends the paraclete, the Holy Spirit. Only then could the work of sanctification truly be accomplished. Thus, the Holy Spirit is the key, and he comes to us at baptism and confirmation, two 
critical Catholic sacraments. In fact, our baptism is linked to Christ's baptism. At his baptism, Jesus is revealed as the beloved Son of the Father. At our baptism, we become the adopted sons of the Father. At Christ's baptism, the Holy Spirit descended upon him. At our baptism, the whole Trinity descends upon us and comes into our soul. At Jesus' baptism, the heavens were opened. At our baptism, heaven is open to us. At his baptism, Jesus prayed. After our baptism, we must pray to avoid sin. So the bottom line is we need baptism to be like Christ. In this way, there is continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Whereas Old Testament prophets announced Jesus from afar, John the Baptist actually points him out in person. Instead of baptizing with water only, the baptism of Jesus will institute baptism with water and the Spirit. Prior to Christ, grace was only signified or symbolized. The body was just cleansed by the water, nothing more. Now, the baptismal rite instituted by Christ and entrusted to his church not only signifies grace, but it is the effective cause of grace. It is grace itself. And baptism confers the first sanctifying grace and the supernatural virtues of faith, hope, and charity, as we said. It takes away original sin and personal sins also, if there are any, along with all punishment. Baptism impresses the Christian character in the soul, allowing the other sacraments and graces to follow. Now, the church fathers said that the dove that appears at Christ's baptism is important. It is a symbol of peace and reconciliation between God and man. A dove, remember, came after the flood uh, with Noah as a sign that God's punishment against man had come to an end. And a dove at Jesus' baptism symbolizes the peace and reconciliation he will bring. Jesus didn't have to die on a cross, and likewise, he didn't have to be baptized, yet he did. And he did this to bless the waters, to make them holy so that we can follow him and also be baptized by water and the Spirit. He did both things to express his solidarity with fallen man and give us a good example. As St. Gregory of Nazianzus said, let us be buried with Christ by baptism to rise with him. Let us go down with him to be raised with him. Let us rise with him to be glorified with him. So again, please baptize your children. Well, Father, I'm going to let Junior turn 18 before he makes that choice, if he wants to be baptized or not. No. Junior didn't wait until he was 18 before he decided to be a part of your family. He was born into it and was automatically a member of it from day one. It is the same with us as a member of God's family. We enter into it automatically at baptism. And who wouldn't want to wash their child clean of sin? Well, if you don't baptize your child, you're leaving them quite dirty with the stain of original sin. Now, many people, though, don't baptize their children because they don't believe in infant baptism. Well, the Bible tells us to baptize our children. St. Peter declared, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children. Or we read this, baptize first the children, and if they can speak for themselves, let them do so. Otherwise, let their parents or other relatives speak for them. 
This is found in the apostolic tradition, 2116, around the year 215. And finally, have you ever been asked if you have been saved? Well, you can answer, yes, I have been baptized. I am now an adopted child of God. Again, Jesus said we must be baptized of water and the Spirit or we cannot enter the kingdom of God. And St. Mark said, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Now, if a family member, though, of yours is not baptized, do not despair. First, pray for them. That's important. And there is also a way for them to kind of be baptized, even though you might not realize it. This is called baptism by blood, such as if they're a martyr that they die for their faith, um, or baptism by desire for those who truly long to be united with God. But don't risk it. Go for the guaranteed grace found in the sacrament of baptism. Now, Baptism is always about a, a new start, a rebirth. Let's hear the story of Father Dustin Fedden of Joseph House, who works with prisoners when they're released to get a new start in society. Prison tries to keep you scared and following their rules by locking you up for all type of charges, which we call DRs, disciplinary reports, that's another whole thing. but. It's not counselors, people trying to rehabilitate this person because they know they're going back on the street. It's none of that. It's feeding lockdown because that's what they have to do. There are very bad people in prison. So me being young, I was 18 and going in there and I got into some of the wrong things and started off bad. and. I started going to confinements and getting into it with the officers, and it, it, it was just, it was a nightmare. Imagine you've been found guilty of a crime. You've served your time. You're dropped off then at a local bus station and handed a one-way ticket to anywhere nationwide. That was the predicament for so many prisoners until Joseph House. On my ride there, I was a little nervous because I'm only used to dealing with inmates, prisoners. You know, I, these are different people. These people are free, they're gonna be different, so I was nervous. But So I walk into the house and the first thing I do is I beeline to this beautiful um, window into the backyard and they have a landscaping that's immaculate. And one of the brothers is the person who did it. So that was all in it too. And I just sat there and I just looked out. Joseph House was established in 2018. Uh, and so we have been up and running for five years and creating a vibrant community for these men, for our brothers, as they're being reintegrated back into society. My 22 years was the darkest place of my life. It was the worst time of my life. It was, I, I, I lost my whole family. I, I, I became another person and it was coming from hell to heaven getting out and coming to the Joseph House. That's all I can sum it up. I was, I was in pure hell for 22 years. When I was a seminarian, before becoming a priest, I shadowed a lay Catholic chaplain in both solitary confinement dorms and on death row. And it was that experience that opened my eyes, uh, one, to the extraordinary humanity of these men, many of whom have committed atrocious acts of violence, and yet there was something uh, profoundly mysterious about their humanity and oftentimes their desire uh, for uh, a new life, of new opportunities uh, to love and serve others. 
Father Dustin and others said, we want this ministry in our diocese and we're ready to do it. And that, you know, when you come to a bishop, to someone with an idea and a plan to carry it out, that almost always gets implemented. Joseph House is not just an institution, it is a community of prayer. You know, yeah, we pray before meals and pray at various times, but it really, it, at the heart of it is the gospel. It's caring for one another. It is serving Jesus in one another. And I'm not just saying that we serve those who are formerly incarcerated and it's just a one-way street, but all of us, they're serving us. They're reminding us of the importance of faith, of how much God loves us. And so that community is built on the gospel. Other programs that I've worked at have seemed very beige and very impersonal. It was very important to us to have pictures on the wall and for people to be able to decorate their own rooms and have reminders that this is home for them. The most rewarding part of my job is being able to see clients again and see how they've rebuilt their lives and all of the things that they've accomplished and all of the amazing work that they've done to turn their lives around for the better. A lot of people I know that got out around the same time I've done that didn't want to come to the Joseph House or didn't have the opportunity to come to the Joseph House are back in prison already, including my son. First 15 years of prison, I wasn't with God. But when I started, those last couple years, just started talking to him again, it, it gave me that he had everything under control. Now I'm being successful. I moved out to Joseph House. I have my own place. I have my, my company. And with religion, I feel like I talk to God every day. I don't make a decision without him. And if I know it ain't God telling me that, I know. So I keep my relationship super tight. And guess what? The Joseph House is going to keep nurturing that because it's an amplifier for God. <laughs> Joseph House is mercy. You know, it really, when we talk, we talk a lot about love, God's love and um, God's grace and God's presence, but it's God's mercy, I think, that, that really touches all of us. All of us are sinners. We know that we're forgiven. I hope we know that. But mercy is just another level. That, that, is, that shows that, yes, not only are you forgiven, but God pours his mercy upon us. And that's really what we want to share with those who are involved with Joseph House. You are loved, yes. God is present, yes. You have the Holy Spirit, but God is merciful and he loves you in his mercy. In the Divine Mercy Prayer, we hear of how the Lord pours out his mercy upon the entire human race, that the Lord is lavish in his grace and in his mercy to all, but most especially to those in need. Of the prisoners released in the United States, 44% return within one year, and tragically, 73% return in five years. To date, we at Joseph House have had uh, 17 men that have lived here and been a part of the community. And of those 17, four have returned back to prison. And, you know, that right now for us is means a 23% rate of recidivism. Look at me now, I mean, I don't think I would have been nowhere near here if I hadn't met Father Dustin and Rachel. Wow, what an amazing story about Joseph House and Prey. What an example and an inspiration of somebody who had been going down the wrong path has now found the right path. Thank you guys for that beautiful example. Now, speaking of beautiful example, let's talk about the example of the Blessed Virgin Mary on a new podcast uh, hosted by Father Thaddeus and Father Tim. These are two Marian priests that have great insight, and things that will help you in your everyday life, living the virtues of Mary, Scripture, and a whole lot more. She's not only remembering the word of God spoken to her through the archangel, she's also contemplating these words, these events. And I think that's at the heart of what you're talking about and what I'm trying to express too in this podcast is keeping it Marian. How to, 
keep these things in our heart, how to keep both the word of God that, that's you know written where we live at the advantage that Mary didn't have, which is we have a written Bible in our own homes. You know, she had access to it in the temple when she was there as a youngster. Um, but we have the, the literal word, inspired word of God with us. And Mary's holding both the inspired word and then these little words, little W words, these things that are happening in her life and holding the two together. You know, I, I mentioned before, she didn't have the end of the story yet. Yeah. We don't have the end of the story. You know, we, we're in our own stories. We're like Frodo and, and <laughs> Sam in the middle of our own stories. Uh, we don't have like, oh, just do this. Uh, it would be nice if we had just a sort of rule book. Yeah. Um, but when you talk about just, you know, stand, I think of something John Paul II said about Mary at the cross and how, you know, that she stood there at the cross is no small thing. That's a courageous thing to do. That's, That's a right. real activity in the midst of chaos, darkness, when the high priest of all people is condemning her son, the authority that should have recognized him. Uh, the political authority is going along with the corruption of uh, the high priest. And she's there standing in the midst of the storm. That's hard. Yeah. Uh, and that's the strength of, of Mary's heart, of her immaculate heart, a heart that's able to, to keep and to hold these words. Um, I just want to uh, close with a few things, but is there anything you wanted to, to mention or to say before I wrap this up for today? No, only the, that I'm very happy to, to be jumping off in this new endeavor with you. Um, and of course, grounding everything in scripture and the tradition of the church. Sure. Uh, as well as, you know, just the tradition of, of uh, all the saints, which, of course, is yeah. included in that. Uh, there's so much um, good out in the world, and we must never lose sight of that because there's always, you know, sadly, since the fall, darkness yeah. present. Oh, yeah. And um, it can be overwhelming sometimes, but, you know, it's in that darkness that we can keep our eyes, you know, fixed on the Lord, fixed on Our Lady, uh, as the guiding stars that are leading us home. Well, thank you, Father Thaddeus and Father Timothy. And if you'd like to learn more about this great podcast and many others, visit divinemercyplus.org. That's our platform where you can find a lot of information about our faith. Now, speaking of our faith, let's go to Brother Alex as he reads in Scripture about the importance of baptism. And Peter said to them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, and to all that are far off, every one whom the Lord God calls to him. And he testified with many other words and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they held steadfastly to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. Why are the people of Jerusalem eager to be baptized? First, they recall the preaching of St. John the Baptist, who baptized for repentance and preparation for the coming of the Messiah. Now, St. Peter offers baptism in the name of Jesus the Messiah, a baptism that includes the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. Moreover, since water is a natural symbol of cleansing, healing, and life, baptism speaks deeply to all human hearts. In his infinite wisdom, the Lord chooses water to be the sacramental vehicle of the new life in the Spirit that we find only in union with him. Thinking of the ancient symbol of Christianity, the fish, the early Christian author Tertullian says, we are fishes of Christ. We are born in water, and only in it do we remain alive. As Blessed Father Michael Sapochko writes, what great graces of divine mercy flow into the soul during holy baptism. With the eagerness of the first Christians, we can turn to Christ and ask for a deeper share in his life and a renewal of the graces of our baptism. Love must be reciprocal. If Jesus tasted the fullness of bitterness for me, then I, his bride, will accept all bitterness as proof of my love for him. 
he who knows how to forgive prepares for himself many graces from God. As often as I look upon the cross, so often will I forgive with all my heart. Through holy baptism, we entered into union with other souls. Death tightens the bonds of love. I ought always to be of help to others. If I am a good religious, I will be useful, not only to the order, but to the whole country as well. Well, thank you everybody for joining us and please be with us next week as we answer the question, is there such a thing as a just war? In fact, with what's going on in the Holy Land, a very needed topic to understand. So until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.